Good morning, everyone. Okay. It is a tremendous privilege for me to stand here once again. It has been two years since the last time I spoke here. That's why please bear with me if I stutter or if I get too nervous. But again, it is a privilege to speak God's word to you this morning. You know, whenever the church of God, whenever the people of God gather together to worship Him in spirit and in truth, to feast over God's word, the church, of, the, church the body of Christ is always nourished. It's always blessed because our spirits are enriched our relationship with one another is fortified. Our relationship with God is strengthened. That is why it is a privilege for us to be here. As we enter this Christmas season, for four weeks, you will study another um, series entitled Chosen. I see your handbooks. Hindi po yan pa may pay, pero okay lang din. Nainitan po kayo. But... But uh, please uh, get your handbooks because you will answer that. The answers will be posted on the screen. And um, we will explore this uh, series and we will study an important figure in the New Testament, Mary. Mary is the one whom God greatly used to fulfill the first advent of the Messiah. There was a Christian woman in Maryland, USA who used to live a very active life. She is a daughter of an Olympian, and she herself is, a, is an athlete. She loves riding horses, biking, and even uh, hiking, and also swimming. This promising woman had a big goal for herself, especially in pursuing sports. In fact, she was voted as the best athlete in her senior year. But one night, everything changed. On July 30, 1967, just after a month of her graduation, she dove in Chesapeake Bay after misjudging the shallowness of the water. She thought that the, the water was deep enough for her to dive. This woman broke her neck and when she dove in the shallow water, when her head crushed the sandy bottom, her head and legs went limp and her body became paralyzed for the rest of her life. In just one day, her whole life changed. It was indeed a painful experience for this woman. In fact, the severity of the situation gripped her heart and it caused her to, to be depressed, to isolate herself, to commit suicide, suicides. And she felt so lost. She felt that her life was over. She felt so weak. And she even questioned the presence and the truthfulness of God. Like most of us, when sudden change happens in our lives, depending on the gravity of the change, we also experience different responses. For some people, we experience disorientation. You know, the, the un, uh, unfamiliarity of the situation makes us disoriented. Or some of us become restless. Some of us, when sudden change happens, we isolate ourselves from others. But if we stay in these negative responses, brothers and sisters, it is detrimental to our soul. It is detrimental to our relationship with one another. It is detrimental to our whole being. The title of our message this morning is When God Changes Everything. And our passage is found in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. This morning, we will study the life of Mary her response and her submission to God when God brought unexpected change in her life. So first, let us take a look at Mary's plan. In your manuals, you can see the outline of uh, this message also. And it says, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. In verse 11 of chapter 1, we saw that the angel Gabriel first appeared to Zechariah. Zechariah is the husband of Elizabeth. Now we must understand that this was an important appearance and an important message. Why? Because it broke the 400 years of silence. So in the Bible, there is what we call the dark ages in the Bible. And that is what that is the time when God did not speak to any prophet. God did not bring any message to his people. But the message of angel Gabriel to Zechariah broke that 400 years of silence. 
And it is astound astounding that just after six months, after he revealed himself to Zechariah, he also appeared to Mary to announce the greatest news that this world could ever receive. And that is the birth of Jesus. And this announcement did not only change Mary's life, but also changed our lives as well. So Mary at that time was probably a teenager. She was a virgin, a young virgin, and probably a teenager. Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. Joseph was an ordinary carpenter and the descendant of David. So Mary and Joseph are said to be engaged. But we must take note that the engagement back then was more binding in the Jewish culture than ours. For to give us an example, back then only death or divorce could break an engagement. And once you're engaged, you are referred to as husband and wife. But in, uh, you're not allowed, except that you're not allowed to have sexual relations. But if a betrothed husband died, that woman is called a widow. And it says that Mary lived in a small town named Nazareth. Now, Nazareth, if you would notice, Nazareth is not mentioned in the Old Testament. Nazareth is a very small town, a poor town that is actually an ins insignificant town. That is why some skeptics throw this... Um, throw this at us. They say that Christ was not really born in Nazareth because Nazareth did not exist in the Old Testament. So this is how insignificant the town was. So probably, as in, an engaged couple, like our, two cop our, our couple here would, uh, would uh, uh, agree, Mary and Joseph were was preparing for their wedding. They were, they were looking forward to their D-Day. And everything was set, their goals are set, their venues, their, their clothes, their invited guests, their foods. But then we can see that Mary's plan was interrupted. It was disrupted. And I want us to put our situation in the shoes of Mary. I want us to, put our situ I want us to, to imagine our lives in the life of Mary. Everything was set, your goal is set, you are on your way to chasing your dreams. And marrying the person that you really love and then suddenly there was an interruption and it says the angel went to her and said greetings you who are highly favored the Lord is with you the Lord is with you so we can see first that God shows Gabriel to visit Mary Gabriel then appeared to Mary with a salutation saying greetings Back then, it was kind of like, hello, or kumusta ka? Um, the word greeting means, be joyful, or continue to be joyful. Gabriel said, Mary was highly favored and assured her that the Lord was with her. So basically, Gabriel was saying, Mary, greetings, be joyful, because you are highly favored and the Lord is with you. Angel Gabriel is saying here is that, Mary is a recipient of God's grace just as God's people are recipient of God's grace. If we sinners are in need of God's grace, then Mary as a sinner also is in need of God's grace. So let us take a look now at God's plan. So by the way, the root word for favored is also grace. It's the same as grace. So now let us take a look at God's plan. And it says, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Upon hearing this salutation from the angel Gabriel, it is said that Mary was greatly troubled and full of wonder. Mary was perplexed. She was greatly troubled. She was terrified, not only for the appearance of the angel Gabriel, but also for the salutation that she received from Gabriel. Mary couldn't understand why the Holy God could favor a sinner like her. You know, we can see that in the Bible that whenever genuine righteous people encounter the holiness of God, they always tremble. Whenever a righteous person 
uh, receive a word from God, they tremble and they become terrified. And we can see that in Isaiah chapter 6. When Isaiah saw the holiness of God, what happened to him? He trembled before the presence of God and he said, Woe is me. When Peter saw the miracle of Jesus, when Jesus calmed the storm, he trembled before the presence of God and he realized that he was in front of the Son of God and he worshipped Jesus. So we can see that righteous people, genuine righteous people, always tremble before the holy presence of God and before his holy word. But angel Gabriel calmed Mary by assuring her of the grace of God. And, she's, and he said, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You're a recipient of God's grace. Gabriel told the frightened Mary to not be afraid and repeated that she found favor with God. And the angel said, You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. This message of angel Gabriel to Mary not only changed her life, but changed the course of the whole world. You see, Jesus is the promised Messiah. He has been waited for so long. You know, God promised the coming of the Messiah where? In the Bible. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, it, was what, it is what we call proto-evangelium or pre-evangelism. It is where God promised the coming of the Savior of the world. And the prophets and the Old Testament saints are all waiting for this coming. And in, in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, it was also said that therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. So Mary would give birth to a son. But take note, this is not an ordinary son. She will give birth to the second person of the Trinity. His name will be called Jesus. Last week, it was um, taught to us that this word came from the Hebrew word Yeshua, means Savior. Mary will give birth to the only Savior of the world. Next, his name would be great. Because as what Apostle Paul said, At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord for the glory of God the Father. Next, he would be called the Son of the Most High God. Mary cannot miss the fact that her Son is co-equal with God the Father. To be the Son of the Most High God emphasizes Jesus' superior rank above all. It is talking about the exaltation of Jesus above all being. And it says he would be given David's throne. David's throne symbolizes the Messianic kingdom. Jesus came from the lineage of David, and he is the rightful heir to the throne of David. And last, he would reign forever. Jesus' kingdom has no end, and he shall reign forever and ever. And one day we will all witness the consummation of this kingdom with Christ ruling this kingdom and all those who are in him will reign with him. So God's people, one day it is our great comfort that even though we are lowly in this world, we are despised in this world, one day we will share the joy in Christ and we will reign with Christ. So when Mary heard this great and divine revelation from God, she then asked, How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. So Mary asked how this was possible because she was a virgin. But keep in mind that Mary's response was not like of Zechariah's response. Mary's response was based on confusion rather than unbelief. She is so confused as to how these things will take place. And Mary makes a strong affirmation of her virginity. And the angel answered, 
the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Gabriel told Mary her baby would be conceived by the Holy Spirit. And Jesus' virgin, virgin birth was both a miracle and a mystery. Mystery can lead us to confusion and frustration or to reverence and humility. You know, even the physician Luke who wrote the, the Gospel of Luke cannot fully understand. You know, as a physician, you're acquainted with science. As a physician, he, he couldn't fully understand this mystery, the virgin birth of Jesus. Yet Luke emphasized that Mary was a virgin. The term virgin in Greek is paternos, and it refers to as a person who has never had sexual relations. This is a crucial doctrine in our Christian faith. Our Savior had to be born by a virgin woman. But why? Even in the Apostles' Creed, we say he was born by a virgin. Why? Because first, it was prophesied in the Old Testament that the Messiah will be born by a virgin. Second, Albert Muller once said, If Jesus was not born of a virgin, who was his father? There is no answer that will leave the gospel intact. The virgin birth explains how Christ could be both God and man. Now, how he was without sin and that the entire work of salvation is God's gracious act. Jesus cannot be born on ordinary means because if he has been the product of Joseph and Mary's intimacy, he will then be a sinner and therefore he cannot be our great mediator and savior. Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit and was born by the Virgin Mary attesting to the claim that he is truly God and truly man. How then did Gabriel answer the question of Mary? And he said, even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. That looks impossible, right? And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. You know, I like the English Standard Version. It says, for nothing will, for nothing will be impossible with God. Gabriel used Elizabeth's pregnancy to illustrate God's power. Mary knew that to be pregnant while being a virgin is impossible. But God, but angel Gabriel rather, then told Mary about the pregnancy of her cousin Elizabeth to show that in, in, with God, nothing is impossible. In Genesis chapter 8, verse 14, we can see the similarity and affirmation of God's omnipotence. It is said by the angel in that's Genesis 18, 14. It says to Sarah and Abraham, Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. Gabriel assured Mary that God will always fulfill his promises. God is able, and God will always fulfill his promises. So what was Mary's response when, he, when she heard this from the, uh, from the angel Gabriel? And she said, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. First, we can see that Mary declared that she was the Lord's bond servant. Again, last week, we learned that the Greek word for servant or bond servant is doulos. And it means slave. Mary acknowledges that she is God's bondservant. She submits to her Lord because she knows that she is not her own. She did not seek his own her own life. She did not seek her own goal, her own purpose in life because she knows she belongs to the Lord. Second, we can see that Mary surrendered herself and accepted her role in God's plan. Mary submitted her all to her master, who knows all things, who owns all things, who is in control of all things. Mary surrendered her life for the glory of God. Not reluctantly, but joyfully. 
You know, this is a hard time for Mary because who would believe that she's conceiving the Son of God and the Savior of the world, right? If you would imagine, even Jesus' brother did not believe in him at first. So think how hard it was for Mary to bear this message, to receive this message, the responsibility that she was given. But you know what? Mary defied all of this. We can see that Mary, by God's grace, chose to please God regardless of the consequences. Mary could have been labeled as immoral. She could have been publicly humiliated. She could have been rejected by her family and friends. She could have been divorced by Joseph and worse, can be killed by being stoned to death. Because back then, it is legal that if you catch someone committing adultery, you can kill the person by being stoned to death in a public, public space. But Mary, Mary's eyes are fixed not on the consequences, not on the struggles, but her eyes were fixed on the almighty, sovereign God who will not fail her, whose words will never fail. Her faith eclipsed her fear. The good news that she received from the angel Gabriel eclipsed the hesitation that could arise from her heart. Mary surrendered her all to the Lord. Upon hearing this message, as I stated all the facts, I hope I did not bore you with the facts because that is the fund foundation of our principles. We have to see the God who is so big, the God who is able to fulfill her promises, fulfill his promises. Upon hearing those facts, what are the principles that we can draw out from our passage this morning? First, first, our plans may be good, but God's plan is better. Our plans may be good, but God's plan is better. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, God interrupts our plans with suffering and setbacks. Others with great news, like Mary's. I believe one way or another, nakakagets, nakakarelate po tayo dito because all of us were affected by the pandemic. Suddenly, our lives were changed. In one night, everything changed. And like Mary, in just one night, her plans were disrupted. Her life was changed. And most of the time when change happens, sometimes it just does, it, it feels, it doesn't make sense at all. It doesn't feel right at all. You know, a person's life can dramatically change overnight. I remember when I was a fifth grader, it was Wednesday at 5 p.m. As I was entering the church premises, I, I saw a van pass through me very, very fast. And little did I know it was my mother who is being rushed to the hospital because of heart attack. You know, overnight, I and my family's life changed, and it changed forever. My mother stopped working, and we were greatly affected. Our finances were greatly affected, our movement, our daily life. Mind you, our house back then was being constructed. And we are forced to live in an unfinished house. And you know, my, pa my father is also a pastor, so that means we have to tighten our belts and really live by faith daily. When I was a child, I couldn't really understand why do these things happen to us? Lord, why are these things happening to us? My, my parents are your servants. They lived almost their whole life serving you. And it seems unfair for me to experience that as a child. It doesn't make sense. And there was no answer from the Lord. You know, as I grew up, as, I, as God continued to reveal himself to me, some things started to make sense. But there are many things are still unanswered. Why did that happen to us? Why, why my mom? It didn't happen. It, it, the, the, the questions were not answered. But you know, I realized something. That I do not need to know all the answers to why God did it to us. We don't need to know all the answer as to why God allowed this pandemic and took some of our loved ones, our health. It's hard to accept. But what's important is 
we know the God who knows the answer. And that is enough. Some of us, our lives were changed dramatically when one day we realized that we woke up, that our loved ones are not with us anymore. Or we're diagnosed with a sickness. Or we did not pass the entrance exam. Or we are we are uh, forced to transfer to another company or location or the business that we established for so long suddenly is in the brink of collapse. There are so many unanswered questions. But as children of God, we don't need to know the answers to us why God did it. What we need to know is the God who knows the answer. And we can be assured that he, as his children, we are highly favored. We are recipient of God's grace. We can be assured that God is able to turn even the bad things, the worst calamities, the unexpected setbacks for our good. Second, our life may be difficult, but God is with us and he is faithful. Can you imagine the responsibility, the responsibility that was given to Mary? Some would think that, oh, she's the mother of Jesus. She probably lived a very comfortable life. But that is not the case. Her life was hard. Remember when she was about to give birth, there was no room for her in the inn. Jesus was not born in a finest hospital, but in a humble manger. And Mary, Mary experienced those all. Even at to the point of Jesus' death, imagine you're a mother and you're seeing your child being crucified on the cross. What a struggle it was. But perhaps Mary, whenever she's discouraged, always look back to the salutation of Gabriel. The Lord is with you. You are recipient of God's grace. In the same way, brothers and sisters, our Christian life will always be marked with suffering and pain with persecutions and afflictions. And sometimes we are tempted to ask God if, God, if God is really with me, why do these things happen to me? If God is really loving, why do these things happen to my family, to my business, to my job? And at times when we look at what's happening to us, it feels like God has abandoned us. Maybe some of you right now, I don't know what you are going through. Maybe you are doubting the Lord's faithfulness, the Lord's presence. It is Satan's goal for us to doubt God, to lose sight on God, to doubt the character of God. Did he attempt that to, did he tempt Jesus the same way? If, look at your Bibles in Matthew chapter 4 and you will find po, that, G, that Satan tempted Jesus with what? If you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God, Satan always loved to make us doubt what we knew to be true. So friends, if we are so burdened with difficulty, if you are so tempted to doubt the presence and faithfulness of God, I invite you to go back to the cross of Christ and remember how God's love was demonstrated for us, how Jesus left his glory above so that we can be with us in this world, how he suffered in this world so that we can be reconciled with the Father, how the Father abandoned his Son, how Jesus threw himself to the sea of God's wrath for our judgment, so that we who deserve to be forsaken may be accepted. We who deserve to be condemned may be forgiven. Friends, go back to what happened 2,000 years ago and you will see that God is with you. He is for you and He is faithful to you. Remember what God said in Jeremiah 31, 3. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Romans 8, 38 to 39, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So, brothers and sisters, instead of asking, If you love me, Lord, maybe we can change that if with, Because you love me, Lord, what are you teaching me through this suffering? Because you are with me, Lord, 
what are you what what is the response that you want me to make in this suffering and because god is with us because he loves us because he is faithful to us we can say even though i walk through the valley of the shadow of death i will fear no evil for you are with me your rod and your staff they comfort me as apostle paul said we are sorrowful yet we are rejoicing third our last principle is this our life may look insignificant but god can use us mightily if we surrender to him completely can we say this together ready start our life may look insignificant but god can use us mightily if we surrender to him completely god called and used a teenage girl from a small poor town from nazareth for others they would say why would god use a teenager why would god use such a young person she is not prepared to conceive the message of god and nurse the messiah but why would god use a person who seemed insignificant small and weak why didn't god use elizabeth a more experienced woman of her time or maybe someone who came from a noble family you see in the economy of god he always display his power through the weakness of his servant he wants to demonstrate his adequacy in our inadequacy so you may be thinking i'm too small i'm too weak i'm too insignificant i'm too young i'm too old to be used by god i cannot i can't do that i cannot be used by god brothers and sisters this is a wonderful news for all of us that if we surrender our lives to god if we offer our bodies as living sacrifice to god the lord will use us greatly in his vineyard first corinthians chapter 1 26 to 29 said for consider your calling brothers not many of you were wise according to worldly standards not many were of noble birth but god shows what is foolish in the world to shame the wise god shows what is weak in the world to shame the strong god shows what is low and despised in the world even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are so that human beings might so that no human beings might boast in the presence of god earlier i showed with you i shared with you about the woman who became paralyzed for her dangerous dive in chesapeake bay she thought at her at first that her life was lost her life ended there at first she could understand why her life suddenly changed her life became so difficult and she felt so insignificant and useless because literally she couldn't do anything what she used to do but god worked in her life mightily the woman i was talking about is familiar to some of you she is joni erickson tada she authored 48 books started a foundation called joni and friends in 1979 to bring christian ministry to the disabled and traveled around the world as a speaker singer and advocate she also got to marry in 1980 and god indeed used her for his glory the lord did not heal her physically but she said that because of that sudden change in her life it led her to true healing a true and deeper healing the healing of her soul she said a no answer to my request for a miraculous physical healing has meant purged sin a love for the lost increased compassion stretched hope an appetite for grace an increase of faith a happy longing for heaven a desire to serve a delight in prayer and a hunger for his word oh bless the stern schoolmaster that is my wheelchair it is all to the praise of deeper healing in christ you know in the 50th anniversary celebration of her accident she said after 50 years in the wheelchair 
I still walk with Jesus. Joni is used mightily by God in the ministry. Not because she is able, physically able, not because she is physically strong, but because God is strong and God is able. Joni is ministering to many Christians around the world up to this day, especially to those who are with disabilities. And indeed, nothing is impossible with God. No matter where we are, no matter what ages, what our ages right now are, no matter your capabilities, God is more than able to use you. Friends, as we close, what is God disrupting in your life? What is God changing in your life? There may be unanswered questions right now. Ang dami nating tanong na hindi nasasagot. Ang daming tanong bakit nangyari to, bakit kailangan ng kailangan ma-experience sa buhay to. But this is our hope. The world may change. People around you may change. Circumstances may change. But God will never change. He is still faithful. He still loves you. And He loves you from everlasting to everlasting. And we can be assured that whatever God is doing in our lives right now, whether it be good or bad, that we are experiencing right now, we can be assured that it is always for our good and for His glory. So trust Him. Serve Him. Love Him and find refuge in Him. Grace and peace to all of you.